Are we drone for tour yet? <laughs> there can be only one. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. All out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello and welcome to Cinema Royale and I got some explaining to do to you guys. In the end of the 30th episode, we we reveal that Adam Sandler is going to be the episode next. Well, we had that night. We talked about Adam Sandler films. We had a guest on the podcast and I didn't record it. So mm-hmm. we decided to skip it and move on because why not dwell in the past when you keep going in the future and just quickly a lightning round we go through saying which one's the best and worst of Sandler films just favorites best right, right now? Yeah, really quick so f- best in all at the same time in three two one best I would probably go um, Billy Madison or 50 first dates I kind of said two, so I cheated, kind of. <laughs> Don't you love Canadians? They cheat a lot. <laughs> hey, but it's cheating for being nice. That makes it extra Canadian. <laughs> um, I do agree. Billy Madison is actually one of my favorites. Oh, so Happy Gilmore is as well. I'm cheating as well. Mm. You mean Happy Gilmore? Happy Gilmore. Yeah, you said Happy Madison. That's the whole freaking pr- production. <laughs> All Happy Madison films, and I do mean all. That's not what I meant. I meant Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore, which both of them came combined into me, the, the company. Those two films combined. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Otherwise, well, okay. Games? My best, worst, best, wedding singer, worst, eight crazy nights. Oh, crap. We also got to include our worst. Yeah. Oh, crap. I wanted to, uh, well, I, James went out. On. James went out of the box there because I was gonna say the worst. That's my boy. Yeah. Well, no, we, we we all agree that's like the ultimate worst. That's like the ugly. This is like the the diet coke of the ugly worst. No, <laughs> mine is still eight crazy nights. Wow. I'm sorry. It just really. Uh, yes. N- wow. n- not even. Yeah, but the, eight not crazy even... nights has good animation. It's actually like. We know there's people who did a good job at it, unlike freaking That's My Boy. Yeah, and even Eight Crazy Nights didn't have Adam Sandler jerking off to grandmother porn. No, but it still had shit-eating reindeer. This movie had a cum-stained wedding dress. I can take that in live action. You can't. I can't take this That's shit boy in the animation. Incest, One of the main characters actually licks it. Yeah, it was bad. Okay. Good thing I had that memory out of it. <laughs> I don't... It's like, licks it. I don't remember that. But yeah, yeah, she, she, she sniffs it and she's like... <laughs> oh, God. You came on my dress! <laughs> oh, God. Okay. <sighs> okay, for me, well... I haven't seen a lot of the recent Adam Sandler films, so other than That's My Boy, the worst, I would say, Hotel Transylvania. Not definitely... I would take Hotel Transylvania any day of the week more than That's My Boy, but still, not that great of a movie, honestly. Not not really good. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, good. There you go, guys. You have a... Your worst? (laughs) Wait, Mike, you didn't say your worst. Yeah. Oh, no, you said That's My Boy. My... Boy. No, no, it's Morgan that didn't say. No, 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 no. Is, isn't it Jack and Jill, Mike? I could take Jack and Jill over. That's my boy any day. Really? At least it's, ra- at least it's rated PG. <laughs> Jack and Jill was rated PG. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a family picture. You yeah, know, yeah, Adam Sandler and Drags is a family picture. All right, all right, all right. For me, um, I want to say Happy Gilmore, but being the obscure guy, best is Shakes the Clown. Um, great movie, very underrated. One of Bobcat Goldthwait's earliest as a drunken party clown. Um, again, I'll be very quick. Adam Sandler plays a minor character as um, Dink the Clown. 
he's very very mellow with it he's not over the top which i find very interesting with that um it's got tom kenny in this movie as the villain he's really over the top with it and if you don't know who tom kenny is he did the voice of spongebob squarepants and he was heifer the cow in rocco's martin life so god rent this movie rent this movie it's dark but you know in its own way it works pretty well to its advantage um worse for me is grown-ups 2 it went nowhere. It, it's a film that legitimately went nowhere. And seeing we had Sarah here, and she's not here, I'll have her represented as myself. With some assistance. Personally, I can't remember exactly any Adam Sandler. Everything I say was actually good about Adam Sandler. I think it might have been The Wedding Singer or something. Though I do know for a fact I can't remember any... Bad Adam Sandler I've seen before, except for, that, for, except for the Water Boy. And by the way, you motherfuckers are absolutely wrong about that, Spy Boy. I think it's actually not that bad of a movie. <laughs> oh, the yeah, wonderful that's... conversation we had. Man, man, man. That lost to, uh, lost to, uh, lost to time forever. Yep. And this is why I am actually really pissed off about this. That the the episode is not making through. I had to watch freaking That's My Boy for nothing! For freaking nothing! Actually, it's not for nothing. We can talk about it in a future episode. Maybe. Yes. Yes. You, you, you wasted me, you pigs! Doom, doom, doom. <laughs> <laughs> doo, that, doo, 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 doo. There is your... <laughs> and on top of that, Mike, probably the most funniest moment was missed out, so I have no choice but to recreate it. As you know, Adam Sandler did a sketch on SNL when he was doing Halloween costumes, like last-minute stuff. And then came my favorite sight gag. I can see this earlier. I'm Crazy Newspaper Face! And I want some candy! <laughs> Give me your candy, you Crazy Newspaper Face! Come on! I have a damn newspaper attached to my face! Extra, extra, read all about it. Give Katie the crazy newspaper face. Give me some I candy. Actually rem- I actually remember that. I remember yeah. seeing that skit all in the. Wait. I think I actually have it. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I actually have the best of Adam Sandler on SNL. Yeah. Only enough. I think it's. I think I either. I think I have Adam Sandler and Christopher Walken. Yeah. You should get the Chris Farley one. It's good too. Oh, well, if Chris, it's Chris Farley. I, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah. Van down by the river! <laughs> well, you can think about <laughs> living in a van down by the river when you're living, living in, in a van, van down, down, down by, by the, the river. river. Have you sleep in your bed? Could you please? Have you sleep in your bed? I know I have a bed over there, but can, can I please sleep in your bed? Can we please stop this stop crazy the Let the boy sleep in your bed! Come on! He said he wouldn't wash the damn sheets! You vicious bastards! <laughs> All right. There is your... There's... In conclusion, what the fridge ever happened to that, Adam Sattler? Yes. Money happened... Mm. Money? Well, more than just money, but it. Well, there's something. also money and the vacations, you know? Mm hmm. Well, it, it's funny, too, because the one thing we didn't talk about in the episode, I might as well bring up very briefly. In the movies, he plays douches, but behind the camera, when he's doing interviews, he sounds like a nice guy. Like, he legitimately sounds like a nice guy. No, I heard he's a, he's a nice guy. Oh, absolutely. He, mm-hmm. he really. So it, it's weird. He does bad movies, but yet. He's a good character, which I find bizarre. I know the re I, I know a perfect explanation, but it'll take a while and it'll be far away from the main subject that we will talk about, which is Mike. Dun, 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 dun. It is TV shows based on films. <sighs> there it's interesting how TV shows adapt from the original film source. It's like, I guess, T 
TV networks are like, hey, let's take a film and then expand the universe, expand the adventures of your favorite characters in these films and make a TV show out of it. Um, some are f- fall misses and some are just good. I mean, and we're here to talk about these TV shows themselves. We have 12 shows for you guys. Each of us has three to talk about. And, um, yeah, it just it makes you think, like, what TV shows and what movies do they come from? Like, which movies do you want to see explored in a TV series? That's the, good, that's the question of the day. What movie would you like to see explored more in a TV series? Hmm. Well, uh, who wants to start the conversation with one of their choices? Well, seeing I have the earliest that I picked, I might as well. Um, as you all know, certain films, you know, have always this starting range of creating these, um, groundbreaking moves. And it's weird because one of the franchises I always look back to in terms of groundbreaking um, merchandise and expanded universe, even before Star Wars, I might add, has to be the Planet of the Apes series. Mm. And, you know, before you start argumenting in, oh, but Universal Monster films do that sort of thing, here's the problem with Universal Monsters. Every time they do a new Frankenstein movie, they keep on goddamn rebooting the monsters. Think about it. Uh, the Son of Frankenstein, Ghost of Frankenstein, uh, Dracula's Daughters, or whatever it's called. Um, then there's a the... new Apple version, I Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. I... Don't get me started. Sexy uh, uh, undead man Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Plan of the Apes is the one that's sort of in its own universe. It has its own continuity. You know, five movies... Um, each one of them, even if one's bad, you can still admire it and enjoy it for what it is, for its own concepts. Um, and when you really argue it pretty, pretty well, it's legitimately the first film franchise to have a storyline. An actual storyline that's not confusing, not problematic, and it just connects. It legitimately connects. As I said before, the Universal Studio Monster stuff, you have to legitimately add up all the differences and all that sort of thing. And the problem is because it was the 30s and 40s, they kept on, you know, retreading or rebooting certain story ideas. But in Planet of the Apes case, when they stopped at the fifth one, um, they were going to do another movie, but tragedy struck. Mm -hmm. It's loving producer Arthur B. Jacobs sadly passed away. And he was the one that shepherded the series. And if you don't know him, he's been known for launching the career of... And I have to do some quick searching here. Uh, he, he did do some work with Marilyn Manson. Uh, not Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Monroe, sorry. But he's known for launching the career of Shirley MacLaine um, in What a Way to Go. And he's known for funding various huge projects, 20th Century Fox, like Dr. Doolittle, which sadly bombed. Um, But Planet of the Apes was a really, really big one, because that's the one where they legitimately said, okay, let's stop at this sequel. And then Fox would say, oh, no, no, we need another one, we need another one, let's see what you guys can do. Um, Okay, we'll have two of the apes go back in time to Earth and frolic around and all that sort of stuff. And at some point, even considered doing a TV show. And because of Mm. his commitment to the sequels and other projects, that never happened. Um, Stuff like Goodbye Mr. Chips, a Tom Sawyer musical, and stuff like that. So then they tried to um, pull a post-Jim Henson and see if it would work. If the franchise still had some legs and do a TV series. Yeah. I think we saw your episode, but it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. I um, even when I think back to it, it's just uh, there's potential, 
but the story keeps repeating itself. It's these two astronauts crash on an Earth, and by the way, in this version, the apes don't give a you know rat's ass about whether humans talk or not. That's a biggie. Mm. So in this universe, um, two astronauts crash land. They immediately find out that they're in the future Earth thanks to a hermit who has all these encyclopedias and stuff. Yeah, go figure. They get captured by the apes. Uh, Dr. Zayas is represented by a different actor who's not that bad, but at least he um, nails the mannerisms of the original actor. If... Oh, what was his name? What was his name? What was his name? Uh, f- not Maurice. Was it, was it Maurice Evans? Um... I know, I'm, I'm cheating here. Yeah, yeah, it was Marie Seven. Sorry, I was... Oh, actually, it was right before I even searched it up. Sorry. Um, instead of Maurice Evans, they have Booth Coleman doing him. Who actually isn't too bad. Um, yeah, yeah, Booth Coleman, sorry. But... Um, in terms of relating to the spirit of the film the film series um there are some ups and downs and some good stuff with it they try to put a few spins like going into ruins and stuff like that or expanding more on the whole universe of the world um roddy mcdowell is in it as a fugitive chimp because it's roddy mcdowell and he's the only action to be in every single ape film i guess um because he's he's likable enough yeah, he's he's expendable. Mm-hmm. And like Kira Hunter is Zero. He's like the third favorite character of the franchise. Um, and before you get me started with Charlton Heston, that's a whole other topic for another day. But no, with the series, it's pretty much the Dukes of Hazards on an ape world. That's like the only way to describe it. Like legitimately, they get captured by apes. They escape from the apes. They go into a human weirdo colony or whatever and the apes intervene there's a whole episode where they're in these building ruins and one of them gets trapped in the building with a gorilla and the gorilla tries to kill him off and they have to somehow work the way out to escape and stuff like that and he holds this secret or whatever and it's a poster of the zoo or something like that and there's points where they try to do like nice twists here and there but at the same time it doesn't live up to what the film was doing where it was nice and tight and slim and you had these folks and characters here it was rehashing one story after another and another and another and another and the fact that these fugitives are being hunted down you don't you know think to yourself why can't they capture these guys in the first place to prevent a 13 episode series and the fact that this is supposed to be like a one hour situation science fiction fantasy drama it, it can get really tiring and so not to waste it enough somewhere down the road they were edited into five telefilms which ironically enough got syndicated on the fox movie channel which is now fox hm go figure hm uh fx took over the uh station so is that shit for a fox hmm (laughs) i guess but, you know, even at the time, it was a really risky show and an expensive one. And it was going against um, TV shows like Sanford and Son, which shows where the downfall kind of lays in. You have Red Fox arguing with um, his uh, younger offspring there in the junkyard. And then you have this repetitive show about apes and humans trying to run away from them. So it's sort of a win-win scenario. You want your comedy or your retreaded story. And I think that's what led to the ultimate downfall was the time slot it was placed in and just the whole concept was not fully realized. Now, if it was like an anthology series like The Twilight Zone where it was following different character stories, there would have been potential to expand on the universe. But the fact they went all dukes of hazards on it and tried to make it this retreading sort of thing... That's where they went dudes of hazards, plural. <laughs> Let me tell you, them good old ape boys better be running after them humans, otherwise they'll be going to that forbidden zone to discover the secrets of the planet. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly what I was thinking when you were comparing this to Dukes of Hazzard. It's like, now them boys better keep this a secret or else Dr. Zayas is about to go bananas on them. <laughs> but like I said, it's not a bad series. It's just mediocrely enjoyable, and that's the problem. Even the humans don't really go back to their own time world unless you consider the telefilms where Roddy McDowell had to shoot these introductions where he explains that they found some weirdo machine and was able to go back in time to their period. Which just shows how cheap they are in explaining that whole thing. Although, I do have a question for you, Morgan. Um, you know, when I was checking the list and I, I tried to find, and I found Planet of the Apes, I noticed that there were actually two shows. There was yes. the live-action Planet of the Apes and also an animated series called uh, Return to Planet of the Apes. Do you have any say uh, on that one? Or? I'll give it this much. Um, we see apes driving cars. We see apes flying planes. Mm. We see apes doing things close to the Pierre Bouvet novel that the film series is actually based off of, which... You know, I should have mentioned in the first place, this whole thing is based off a French novel known as The Monkey Planet. Mm. Huge bestseller, same guy wrote Bridge on the River Kwai. I would like this animation series, but the reason why I turned it off in the first five minutes was that the animation sucks. And I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, but it's so terrible. It's like moving a bunch of cutout cardboard people on a background that's how bad it is and it was a bad time for animation um the opening is not that bad in its own trippy way but when you see the actual episodes you're just sitting there going oh my brain is melting it's just sort of slipping slowly out of the ears yeah and, 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 and to its credit, sorry, and to its credit, they try, uh, but I actually give more effort to the live action version because of the more budget in the sets and the costuming and everything in between. This is animation. They should get away with a whole lot more, but they don't. It just feels so limited. Um, they do bring back a character from the fifth movie, General Aldo, who is okay, I guess. He wasn't really that memorable to me, but he's a little bit fun. Um, but overall, it's a much more mediocre entry than the live-action one. And I see, Mike, you have a bad movie back scratcher like I do. Yeah, I was actually trying to... I was doing a bit of research on like who did the animation and stuff, and apparently it's from a studio called the Patty Freelang Enterprises. Has they... It's I've the never Patty heard Furling? Them. Yeah, the Patty Furling, yeah. The, um, I never really heard of them before, but apparently they've done some uh, some pretty... some more recognizable works. They Their most popular one would be the animated Pink Panther series... And also, they did a lot of the uh, Dr. Seuss TV specials, except for The Grinch, because The Grinch was uh, Chuck yeah. Jones. So, yeah, they've done a few. Oh, yeah, they even did some. Um, they even did some Looney Tunes ones, like Bugs Bunny's Easter special and Bugs Bug, Bugs Bunny's Looney Christmas Tales. Here's a still Looney the Christmas end. Tales. Yeah, Looney Tunes Christmas Tales, Looney yeah. Christmas Tales. Yeah. Here's a still of the animation, and looking at it now, it has a very comic bookish kind of thing to it, which I can see being utilized for a comic book, but it's so freaking stiff. Yeah, it has a good design, but I don't see the, like, I just can't see the animation. Like, oddly enough, this is very, from the style of it, it seems more reminiscent to, like, how it is today with, like, a lot of Adult Swim cartoons, oddly yeah. enough. And if this was like an if this was an Adult Swim re-edit, I would buy it. 
I would legitimately get into it. I'd be like, okay, perfect. That'd be great seeing them being redubbed by you know the uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force cast. Yeah, or like I'm it's so- like a heart like they would make an appearance in a trial for Harvey Birdman, attorney at law. Yeah, yeah, and then they'd have Master Shake voicing Doc. No, no, no. They would have the guy who plays Carl doing Doctor Zayas. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Hey, this is going to be in trouble. Hey, hey, go, go, go. Ah, damn it, baby. Uh, what are you doing in my lung? Get out of my fucking property, you stupid white hairy hairless beasts. Oh my gosh. Would you like to know the no, point no, no. that I turned the cartoon off? Where? Right after the intro. Um, in the, uh,. In the first five minutes, when the spaceship is uh, coming into planet Earth, crash landing, albeit uh, the computer on board the on board the spaceship is making the the same exact noise as the uh, as the uh, the chocolate shrink machine from uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. You know, <laughs> like we're flying over Earth in a million tiny pieces. <laughs> Hold on, I'm on the computer. <laughs> Mozart. You know, I can. I'm I sorry, can, Dave. Could you play that again? I, I, I actually now want to see an alternate ending to Planet of the Ends. It's like, damn you, damn you all to hell. And then you see Doctor Zeus. Hey, uh, you know, I heard that that statue over there is actually a hot babe. <laughs> I wonder what I, I wonder if she's pretty hot. I wonder how big her ass is, you know? <laughs> well, back Tonight. in the day, we used to call her Debbie. <laughs> the statue of Debbie. <laughs> no, not, no, 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 not that statue of Debbie. We're, we're talking about if the Statue of Liberty is you, you know? <laughs> we made the clowns, Cornelius. <laughs> Um, with Nate the Chimp. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm show that MST3K sketch later. Oh, my God. Um. Trying to do his homeless Bobcat impersonation. <laughs> Damn it, I'm Jane, motherfucker from Firefly. <laughs> uh, you see, Morgan, you're already rubbing on us. <laughs> and I'm a chicken in a maze. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this conversation going before he trails off to a, a distant, far future. <laughs> Damn you guys. I'm the reason Firefly got cancelled. I didn't watch it. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I had no interest. You flipped the channel. Oh, oh okay. Well, our only viewer is gone. The show is cancelled. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, wait, he's back. Oh, no, no. I still flipped the channels again. <laughs> so, uh, in preparation of this episode, I gathered James and Matt in a screening of some random TV show pilots. Just, you know, a couple of pilot episodes. And, um... Gee, I wonder if it's one I painfully watched last night. You watched some last night? Which one did you watch? Uh, Mike, I'll text it to you. Yeah, yeah do that. Do that, Excel. Because I want, I want to surprise these goons. Let's see. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, as you were saying, Mike... Or... Oh, we didn't do a viewing of that, but... You <laughs> son of a bitch! <laughs> we I suffered through that one! Oh, poor you. <laughs> He'll mention uh... it. He'll mention it. It's pretty interesting, yeah. actually. But okay. we, we viewed three cartoons and a live-action series. Um, I'll be covering two of the shows we uh, screened. Um, and me and James will cover one each. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I decided. So... First up, we saw a cartoon based on a R-rated movie from the 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, that show being have... RoboCop, the animated series. I have a question, and this is going to be uh, this is going to be sort of an ongoing thing here. But why do I why do I get the feeling that uh, a lot of the 
a lot of the uh, TV shows that we're going to be talking about um, usually seem to survive better if they're turned into a Saturday morning cartoon. Or do they? For the kids, you know. I mean, I mean, they're trying to market to kids, I guess, but... Um, I, I have an example, but I'll save it for later. I think, um... I don't think they last very long. I think most of the shows do last like a season or two, no more than that. Well, the general rule of thumb is that if it's 65 episodes, it's syndicatable. If it's over 100, they got a lifelong span. Yeah. Well, uh, this, uh, and remember, there's only been, there's only been one mash in, in television history. Suicide is painless. It keeps on many changes. Something like that. Never saw the show. Only know the theme. Mm-hmm. Not even the movie. Yeah. But, um, with, with animated shows, though, they seem to have just a little bit more longevity. And that's all I'm. That's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I uh, before we go on further, um, RoboCop spawned off um, a bunch of TV shows. Um, first being the animated series, which we'll get into, and then um, a few live action series, and a few of them Canada was responsible for. <laughs> they seem to like RoboCop so much. They're like, let's make a TV show out of this. Let's make a TV show out of this. Yeah, what can I say? It's a good concept. It is. You can't go wrong with a RoboCop. Yeah, then the reboot happened. Yeah, but that's not our fault. No. I know, I know. He was yeah, just a head connected fault. to lungs. I, 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 didn't, I didn't hate that, you know? I, really I, I, didn't. Didn't, I, I didn't either. I just thought it was a little bit mediocre, but interesting. I didn't watch it, so I, I don't know what to say. It, so, it's harmless. It, it's so, harmless. So let's inform Morgan about uh, RoboCop the Animated Series, since he was not available for the screening. That's <laughs> what I didn't see. Oh my gosh, where do we start? Yeah. I How mean... about... Uh, yeah, go ahead, actually, you could go. Uh, okay, so basically, it, you know, in the intro, that it'll, it does a narration, it provides you what happens in the film via kid... Down, dumb downed, not the whole hardcore violence thing, and um, oh, how do I have no words for it? I cannot describe the po- the plot of the pilot episode. It's okay. It's, what is a plot? Here, it? I could do this. It's literally the cheesiest thing you can ever watch. It's basically every like Saturday morning cartoon action flick that you. Like you can think of, mm-hmm. you because okay. Here's how it starts out. It's pretty much RoboCop trying to stop a robbery from these tough thugs, like these tough, like Brooklyn thugs that are going to steal the money. <laughs> like hey, you know we gotta get to them cash. You know hey, hey, these cops are nothing against us. You know. <laughs> Uh, we can't read, boys. I never went to school. And then afterwards, we also they also have. Then also, there's also a main villain of the series. That's pretty much a. That's pretty much Doctor Claw, because he like he has these steel arms. It's like, blast that Robocop! That Robocop! I have a plan to stop him. Did and you- then. Wait, wait, the, do, do they do they have the ED-209 robot? Yeah, I was just yeah. going to say... The, in the, the middle bag, of the street! The bad guy, kind of, like, he's the one controlling... He has, like, the production of the robot, and the robot now is in doing traffic duty. He's <laughs> doing traffic duty. Does it kill a pedestrian? <laughs> it, you wish. It tries to. Oh. Tries to. Tries At to, that point, it, I want to see him at a school crossing. Yes! Yeah. It, there has to be one at a school cross. Drop I just, the toy gun! You have five seconds to drop the toy gun! I just find it hilarious. I just find it hilarious that the first time we see it is just randomly in the middle of the yeah, street in a highway. Just a stop and go light. It's like it's got a green light and a red light, and it's just like, bing! 
can go? No, but I think one of my favorite parts, there is the cop that's in every, that's in all these kinds of series, this black cop that's in desperate need. No, but he's in desperate need. He wants RoboCop in action. And my and my favorite line of the pilot, Dang it, woman, I need RoboCop! <laughs> so, it's... He um, actually says it. <laughs> Dang it, woman, I need RoboCop! So, the, Gee, best, so, the I, best part of the pilot. So, the main guy is pretty much the boss of these thugs, you know, these Brooklyn thugs, and these telling them what to do and giving them money for it to do it's like a job so one way to get rid of robocop these guys pull out this massive machine yeah. and they mm. call it they call it the kill dozer <laughs> yeah. hey yes hey, hey butthead have you seen the movie kill dozer <laughs> Wait, that's what we were saying like the whole time i was like I, morgan would morgan would just it's just Freaking out that he's not here right now. I know. Hey, yeah. kill loser, kill loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly uh, yeah. what they That movie was cool. Say goodnight. Say goodnight, RoboCops. We got the kill doses here. <laughs> and that, that freaking kill doser, though, it does more damage. It does, like, almost Man of Steel level damage. <laughs> Even at the end, even at the end, when RoboCop gets rid of the bad guys, the freaking Killdozer goes out like, go goes out uh, out of control in and it, it, it's on fire. It's like, well, there goes five freaking buildings. But then the next scene, you don't even see the Killdozer. It's just, yeah. <laughs> it just sort of disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean this problem. thing it was launching missiles and all. It's a perfect Oh, oh that's way. something. No, no, that's no, something no, else no. I want. It's a perfect oh. it's a perfect way to hide an island with full of people in tall buildings. Well, I mean it well, it was on fire, so like it must have like turned into du- it's like after it was gone like 5 seconds later, later it was like <sighs> Oh you know. my god, I missed out on a good night. Oh, right. what, else, what, else, what else do you expect? I mean, uh, this is a show that decided to go from an R rating to a T to a Y7 by taking out bullets and replacing them with lasers. Yep, exactly. They a- replaced oh, yeah. bullets with lasers. It, yep, shot, laser. it, like, yes. it shot a guy in the chest, and the guy was like, oh. Uh, okay, was like, I can. I can live with that. I can honestly live with that because it's in the future, but that kind of ruins the original aspect of it the movie. It looks more eighties, actually. Yeah, I mean, there's even... nothing about it that's futuristic. They're in an arcade, for God's sake. Mm-hmm. I mean, even point, yeah. even I just um, looked at some silent snippets while you guys were jabbing. It looks like the animation from the Free Willy animated series. That's another thing I want to mention, actually. Uh, the you actually anime... watched that. The the end of yeah. the... oh. I had an actual puzzle based on that game <laughs> show. That game. No, but one thing I want to mention is that throughout the whole time in Robocop, the animation itself actually reminds me a lot of Transformers, oddly enough, like Gen One Transformers. Um, I was thinking like, just from the... Ninja Turtles. Well, no, actually, well maybe those kind. No, but it's actually because like all the. All the characters look more realistic in a way, plus the fact that it's like the animation itself is very similar, especially the fact like you got different machines and Robocop and all that stuff. So, like, I wouldn't be surprised if it's from the same people. Mm-hmm. It, they've all got a they got a kill dozer this time, you know. <laughs> the only thing that's missing is the best line from Robocop. Someone to get a goddamn paramedic. <laughs> No, I'd buy that for a dollar. It ain't gonna be. They didn't have that either. They didn't. They didn't have that. Oh my god! They totally could have too. Hey, we got dang it, woman! I need Robocop. But we need. But I'd buy that for a dollar. Is like the running gag of the movie. It's this old guy doing rich, crazy things. There's even a deleted scene where he's in a topless pizza parlor, ogling and groping the boobies. Where's that pizza parlor? 
Uh, it's it's on the Blu-ray. I'm not talking about in the movie. Yeah. I mean, oh, you know, it's, it's a delete scene. But but, but yeah. still, that that robs the original satirical point of the movie. And hearing about it, it's like they just took RoboCop and turned into a watered it, down Twenty One Jump Street. No, but in a sense, this is still kind of sad. No, but it's like. It's so cheesy to the point that it is almost satire in a sense. The fact that they take itself so seriously in that point really helps the factor. Like, I can understand why it's just, it ran for just one season, but still, for the intense cheesiness and corniness of it, like, it's like it's kind of a blast watching well, it. I haven't seen it, so I can't really say much about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, I, um, do you want to go, James, or I can go? Um, I I have nothing else to say about the RoboCop show. No, no, no. Like, moving on. No, do you want to go with your subject or mine? Oh, I think uh, I think I'll I'll take the the mantle here. Um, yeah, the next uh, it, because. Uh, Let's why not stick with chronological order? I think because uh, yeah, I was just gonna say I, I was viewing gonna, order. I guess we should just get through the screening stuff, and then you guys can go into your own shows. So okay. um, let's do that. So let me. Uh, so after uh, RoboCop, I figured we uh, go into another um, late, uh, early '90s, late '80s. Actually, mid '90s. Um, if it's the one. Oh no, wait. No, no. Um, mid '90s. It's late, wait, wait, early nineties, oh, early nineties. Oh wait! Oh well, I don't even know which one you're talking about next. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I'm trying to think of what chronological. I think we did RoboCop, it, and then it we was. Do you remember? One hundred and one yeah, yeah, Dalmatians. The series. Oh, okay, right. that I can relate to. Never mind. That was the wrong show. I'm thinking of. Okay, so. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's. I yeah. think the one that you're you're thinking I know, of. I, I think know. that's it, the last it, one. That's. Yeah, both. Yeah. Are you talking? Is it the live action one or is it anim- the both, animated one? Both were early nineties. We did so much oh. planning, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we did so much bonding. It was cool. So yeah, hundred one Dalmatians. This series is. Um, uh, where do I start with that? That's full of continuities to begin with. Oh, yeah. I so mean, why is there a talking chicken? <sighs> that didn't come in the pilot episode. That came in later in the episodes, but um. It was uh, it it was uh, Clucky's first big break, you know. <laughs> We're talking about nice, nice. Um, but the 101 Dalmatians is apparently based on the original animated film and the um, what is the 98 live action film. So it combines both of those, and it's set in America. Is it 98? Oh. I thought it was 96. Was it? Maybe earlier. 96. Okay, I was wrong. Thank you for correcting me. Um, it it essentially exi- it takes elements of both films and seems to exist within its own universe because yes. it it, um, it it's uh, it oh and I you gotta love you gotta love this moment in the credits where they say it's actually based off of the book. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, wait. it's not. No, it's not. Oh, I'm sorry, it was Spot, not Clucky. Yes. But, um, yeah, so the 101 Dalmatians, the series, this was, when I first when I first saw this show, I was, what, um, we didn't have cable at the time, we just got barely, uh, uh, barely visible, uh, channels on on our on our TV. That's all that really counted, and that was my first introduction to this show on Disney's one Saturday morning. And originally, I didn't like it, but over, over the years, it's sort of grown. I mean, I'll explain to you why I didn't like it, but I'll I'll sort of we can sort of go into why I actually thought it was decent over time. Um, for starters, uh, the, the, uh, the main characters in this series are 
Lucky, Rolly, and Cadpig, uh, three, three of the uh, puppy characters. Three of the ninety-nine uh, puppy characters. Three of, three of ninety-nine puppy characters. Uh, two of which, um, let's see, we had uh, Lucky two. was right out of the nineteen ninety-six movie, and uh, well, well, wasn't Rolly... Lucky also in the animated one? Um, I think so. Maybe, maybe if he was not named, I think uh, uh, Cadpig was definitely in the. No, 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 no. Rolly was. Rolly was in the animated film. I remember. Hold on, I'll I'll, I'll do. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Hold on a sec, Mike. Uh, no, no. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lucky was in uh, the was in the 1961 movie. There was. Rolly, Patch, Penny, Lucky, Sergeant Tibbs, Captain... Well, yeah, you get the idea. And uh, Cadpig is sort of made up for the show, I think. Uh, yeah, I they, think just Cad- needed a, they just needed a quirky, hippie chick character. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I mean, is she not a is she not a hippie chick? I mean, mm-hmm. she is. So she she's is a hipster. Like, she's a hipster. Yeah. I, I'm sensing very bad vibes from everybody. Or, <laughs> uh, she's like she like that type of character. There is very bad vibes here. I need to go back to my chi. That <laughs> plant shouldn't be there. I'll be back for the feng shui. I was. Oh. I'm always wondering what what this character's spiritual path is in life because she seems to be citing every single religious philosophy as the as the series goes on. But um, I, one of my one of my favorite lines from later in the series um, was, uh, "Rolly, gluttony is one of the seven deadly sins, and if you do that to me again, I'll violate the other six on you." He was the ghost of Christmas present in a cruel Christmas carol. Oh God! Uh, that that that, <laughs> that that episode was why initially I was I was not a fan of the show because that was one of the first episodes I saw and oh God, really? A, a, a Christmas Carol TV adaptation. Well, what did you? But, are you really surprised, James? Are, why do you sound surprised about that? <laughs> it had Jasper and Horace as Jacob Marley. <laughs> uh, so what else? What else could go wrong with the show in the beginning of my watching it? Um, well, one of the first episodes that I ever saw was uh, uh, one in which uh, Lucky gets a crush on one of the other characters a uh, two-tone oh dear and now here is here is where we're trying to figure out just um just exactly where the show's allegiance lies in terms of is it is it the animated film is it the live action movie is it its own thing two-tone was in the live action movie she was one of the uh, one of the original uh, litter of puppies that uh, Lucky belonged to. So now in the TV show, her character is being introduced. Lucky has a crush on Two Tone. Is starting to see something here. Uh, I'm got. I must say that. I must apologize. I must apologize to everyone watching this and everyone here. To quote, that's my boy. <laughs> Adultery is bad, but incest is fucked up. <laughs> you had to go there, but there's a reason for it. Yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> it just follows us. It's weird. Well, the this is the Disney company. They got a they got away with Bambi, which is the greatest incest romance ever told. So Wait, it is. <laughs> but um, 
in any case, uh, the rest of the episodes. So... That is true. Actually, I just realized. Yeah. Fully, uh, we're supposed to be brothers. Well, that and also maybe the Lion King, but. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Maybe. As so long as they don't actually come out and say cousins, you know. Uh, but in the case, did that make Kovu a nephew? <laughs> yeah. Get on with um, it. Sorry. Yeah the it, the series itself um, it it actually it it goes through a number of different stories that I don't I don't just find cute. Uh, but I also I also found the the animation was highly was was one of the the highlights of the experience of the show. I mean it it was highly stylized, but they they make sure they make sure the animators to uh, uh, to take advantage of every extreme facial expression that they possibly can. With the characters, especially with Cat Pig, her face is all over the place. <sighs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there's there's one shot that's ingrained in my memory as the in in the show's history in which uh, um, she's actually grinning like this, and she's got one eye to the right and one eye up. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah. Um, and there's there there's some episodes that that come along where they where they they actually tell good stories. You know, um, uh, one of one of them is uh, Lucky decides to run for mayor of the farm, I guess, and he wins by yeah he he wins by making promises that he can't keep. And uh, as a result, uh, there's there's an important lesson in leadership that's uh, that's doled out as the episode goes on. But um, yeah, there, they the show had its high points, and there's there's a reason why people uh, there's there's a reason why some ten fifteen years later it still sort of has this cult fan base going on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, if I may put in my say on it, uh, when I remember way back in the 90s, I remember I actually did watch the uh, show for, like at, at one point. Because I remember when, uh, during the time period when 101, was, uh, 101 Dalmatians was like was hugely popular thanks to the uh, 19, 1996 movie. And um, watching the pilot episode during that time, I thought it was a pretty good show, and for two reasons, I, I will say, both from just as a uh, as a viewer and also as a Disney fan. Number one is because I feel like it has a more Animaniacs feeling to it, mostly through the three main characters, Lucky, Rolly, and Cat Pig. They, they have such a distinct personality, and they really make, um, they really set up this cartoon atmosphere, even though... Like there's a part of it that's supposed supposed to have like a more realistic tone to to it, but like, um, like the three main characters they really bring up this um, cartoon feel feeling to it with very strong personalities, with Lucky being the leader, um, Cat uh, Roly being like this big, like just this just the fat one, and also uh, Cat Pig being this hippie girl. Which I, I find is very unique, and the reason number um, two. Join the puppy siblings and that chicken friend his butt. Just for fun, they run and run the farming lot. Willow <laughs> <laughs> tries to catch us, but she doesn't really not. And da, 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 da. Now you know two. the plot. <laughs> mm -hmm. And number two that I want to add, and this is more for my Disney fan side, is because when I watch these characters, um, when I watch all the characters in there. I feel like these are the same characters that came out of the animated film. Now I know, I know, you guys are going to raise that red flag going, hold on, there's the continuity crap. Because here's the thing. Yes, it is set in, because 
yes, you're right. It is set in America, and everybody has an English accent, has like an American accent. Like even Horace and Jack Jasper are now from freaking Brooklyn. <laughs> oh, like hey, hey, Corella, we're gonna be here. We're gonna capture these dogs for you. It's like yeah, no, but here's here's my reason. Un because here's the thing. They may be from a different region, but for who the characters are, they are still the same ones from the animated film. It's not like in Maleficent where they take the characters from the original uh, animated film and just completely change them to the point that they are unrecognizable. In here, like when you see Roger, it's definitely Roger. When you see Horace and Jasper, it's Horace and Jasper. And the best part is when you see Cruella de Vil, it's most definitely Cruella de Vil. It's the same one from the animated film. It's the same one from the 1996 movie. It, there's no denying it's Cruella de Vil. And, like, they have the same charm and likability. They all have the same charm and likability. So I could see why it has a bit of a cult following. So, so yeah, they, they re Disney really did a good job with this one. Um... I might also notice that Cruella is the only one to maintain her British accent as well. Yep. Well, because British people are evil. Yep. No. Th well, that is that, and also Cruella de Vil is pr pretty much the most popular character. Mm -hmm. Other than the Dalmatians, like the one specific one you can yep. spot is Cruella de Vil. No yep. pun intended. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I. I think I enjoyed it too. I actually remember watching it as well as a as a kid, and um, watching it last week, I just memories flowed right in, and the continuity just goes over my head. I was just like, really? And I, and I was kind of thinking of it now as you as you were talking. I was thinking like, okay, what if what if they move from England to America, and then Cruella de Vil just follow them all the way to America, keeping that English accent, and just lived in America ever since. <laughs> they gotta go buy a farm. Hmm. <laughs> and why? And why? Uh, why is she not in jail too? You know. Yeah. Um, because I think, well, she's rich. Did you see the building that she works in? Yeah, she's ridiculously famous and uh, rich. See, and yet she wants she's like Martha form. Stewart. She can't be thrown in jail for long, you know. But um, I just wanted to mention um, so, like I said, we watched RoboCop the anime series first. So when we watched this one, there was an appearance from a familiar machine-looking thing. That yes, <laughs> it had a killdozer in it. <laughs> Wait, wait, Apparently wait, two shows had a killdozer in it? And that's even though that's where the killdozer went. And even back though, to back killdozers. Even though I saw the show as a kid, this exact episode I did not see had a fucking killdozer in two yes. animated shows. <laughs> it was just like we're watching it, it's like, wait a minute, is that a killdozer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was a it was a regular bulldozer, but you know it kills a car, so it, that no, counts, well, right? Yeah, 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 you're being technical about it, but if you that's think about thing, it, like, that's where the killdozer went. Robocop got rid of it. It went like all the way into the woods, and then suddenly it went right in front of uh, Ro um, Roger's farm, and like <sighs> ready for <laughs> Corella's car yeah. to be eaten. Yeah. <laughs> That was good. It was good. Um, Damn it! So, so we segue into the next uh, show we see, and uh, it's, and, this, this oh, is... I didn't give I... my two cents about that show. Go. Oh yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go. I did. Uh, I did see this show as a kid. Um, Disney's One Saturday Morning didn't really do much for me. Nickelodeon ruined me. <laughs> um, but looking back on as a kid, I enjoyed it because. I grew up heavily on 101 Dalmatians. That was like one of the many films I kept watching over and over again as a kid. Um, but the more I think back on it now, it just feels like a typical Saturday morning cartoon cashing in on a classic. It's not doing much with the characters other than just typically adding in new ones just for new situations. Um, 
but I can't say that I hate it because again I haven't revisited it recently and again I did enjoy some of it as a kid I did see episodes of it as a kid so that says something but there's one thing that did set me back as an adult that I didn't think would exist hmm. Lucky and Tripod fan fiction Tripod? Wait, who's Tripod again? Wait, they're which tripod, one is tripod? Tripod was the three-legged dog who was like very athletic and stuff, even though he had three legs and he had like a green headband. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Why? Huh? I've seen, I've seen weirder fan fictions. That's all I'll yeah. say. That's all yeah. I'm gonna say. So, I don't even want to get into it. I, I'm just that. gonna I'm gonna leave it right there. Yep. I'm gonna leave it right there because the rest of it is nightmare fuel. Mm-hmm. Trust yeah. me. Ooh, ooh, what's <laughs> our dad? Seen... What's our dad doing with Thunderbolt in the TV? I'm gonna leave it at that. I am leaving Watch it at that. Watch what I can that. do with my nub. <laughs> <laughs> they right, are puppies, you stupid nope. twisted authors oh my god we gotta let's move on before it gets even weirder yeah i'm gonna go with i'm gonna take this one the i'm gonna go with the third animated series that we went to that we watched and that one would be bill and ted's excellent adventures mm-hmm. which is uh which is pretty much there were two uh apparently there were two by the way two series of it uh, 1990, there was the animated series, and then in 1992, there was uh, a live-action series by Fox. But from what I've heard, this one really didn't go far. It only went to seven episodes. Mm-hmm. Now, in the 1990, in the 1990s version, it's actually quite interesting to just to uh, talk about. Um, in uh, we watched the pilot episode, which is season one, and you'd be you'd be surprised that a um, of the people who worked on it. Number one, uh, see, uh, it had Hanna Barbera doing the animation, which is actually better than you think. This is the later Hanna Barbera, like during the '90s. This is actually some of their better animation. This is where uh, they had money, you know. Yeah, this is when this is when uh, the car- that cartoon mo- Cartoon Network cash uh, comes in pretty profitable, profitable, and also. Um, not only that, but they even got a lot of the original cast returning. They got Keanu Reeves. They got Alex Winter. They even got George Car- Carlin back. And like when you mm-hmm. like when you when you hear it, like it's definitely them. But then when season two would come along, um, that's when everything changed. That that's when the cast was uh, flipped to get from to uh, Christopher Kennedy and uh, Evan Richards doing bill and ted i presume i think so yeah 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 Yeah. and then like even the animation studio was changed from Hanna barbera to deke um and then suddenly uh that one was done now as for the show itself from the pilot episode that we saw (laughs) what that's all i could say like yeah it's all over the place yeah like it's it's really messed up. It's like you mean the live action one? No, 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 no. The an- no, we're talking the about animated. the animated one. The animated. Why else? Why else am I talking about Hanna Barbera and Deke? Yeah, he's the <laughs> animated nerd. So, uh, <laughs> well, Deke had uh, had uh, the live action Sailor Moon. Oh wait, that never happened. What? Oh, that's right. No, yeah. they have the animated Sailor Moon, dude. I should know. I've actually watched it. <laughs> but anyways, um, I miss. Anyway, anyways, Go on. um, yeah, the show was re- the first episode was really all over the place, just in the pilot episode alone. So like, of course, Bill and Ted would go out just spewing, like, um, just radical pop- catchphrases, yeah, dude. Radical catchphrases dude. and pop culture references. Was like, dude, where are we? We must be in the World Showcase at Epcot, dude. Yeah, and all that. And like, okay, here's the thing. What did they, they, st- Lincoln- oh, sorry. they start out with they start out in China. Like they gotta go find a they gotta go find this um, pot to replace uh, t- to replace the one that they broke from um, uh, a present. Crap. Yeah, from Ted's uh, stepmom. And then 
so what happens is that they go to ancient China to go find the same antique, to find, like, the exact same antique pot. What happens is, like, they get, like, five of those throughout, I think, like, three or five like that, throughout yeah. the course of the episode. And mm-hmm. then suddenly, they go to Italy. Yeah. To, to, and, like, they meet up with Marco Polo, who wouldn't stop singing for some yep. reason. Yep. Uh, Michael Bean is prime. And, by the way, yes, pe- before you ask people, yes, they did that. Oh, you mean, like, this, like, the pool game, Marco Polo? <laughs> that was one they of the jokes. Did. Yes, they That's did. That's one of that my joke. favorite games. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean. Did they order from a Twinkie? <laughs> I, yeah, I think Twinkies were referenced in that episode, uh, oddly enough. Oh, yeah, and then, like, the Chinese restaurant is like, like, I got an idea. You make, why don't you deliver them in these little boxes? And, you know, but, oh, and I like to order something that we like to call a number 10. <laughs> and, like, even, like, some of the people, like, some of the ancient people, like, they all speak perfect English, and they all go, like, oh, Arabica. Or no. maybe not that. Maybe not that bad. Oh, radical, dude. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, See, now you're complaining about the stuff that people love the movie for. Yeah. Yeah, what a Twinkie Genghis Kong. No, 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 no. No, but I mean, like, they did that out of nowhere. Like, they did that without even knowing Bill and... Oh my god, that thing is blue. <laughs> what is that? It's a it's blue, blue Twinkie. Twinkie. It's a blue raspberry Twinkie. <laughs> That okay. actually sounds delicious. Um, mm. It's X-Men related. No, but, like, no, 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 no. The, at least in Bill and Ted, there's a bit of context. In here, like, the char- like the characters don't even know Bill and Ted. We've just met them, and they automatically do, do say things like radical and stuff like that. It's like, do, do you even know? Or like, do you get what I mean? I was going to say... I think, uh, uh, I think, I think Beast splooged in your Twinkie, Morgan. <laughs> Um, so, I was gonna say, I was gonna say that, um, brushing his tongue after uh, eating that Twinkie, (laughs) (laughs) I was gonna say, um, the, um, it's weird how, oh, it's blue, (laughs) God, I was gonna say that, is it it in you? It's, God damn you guys. I was going to say that um, the people in ancient China just seemed weird because um, these guards find the phone booth because it was parked in a no parking zone, apparently. And they're like, what is this? And they're like, this must be a, a, a phone booth. Let's get inside and take a picture. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Wait Need a minute. Photo booth. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm thinking, like, wait, they didn't have photo booths in ancient China, so what the hell is going on? <laughs> so the continuity is kind of weird, isn't it? Again, this was a show I heard, I've seen clips of. I think it's the case of the episode has some good writing, depending on it. Like, for example, there's one where Bill and Ted actually decide to give up doing Wild Stallions, and it causes a huge rift in the future world. And Rufus goes back in time to try and save them, and he slowly starts morphing into a kid. Oh. And the kicker is that he's trying to save the group but not reveal what's going on in the past, and he's slowly going from teenager to tiny kid. And I've heard of this episode, but I've seen bits and pieces of it. So maybe it's a case where there's some points where when the writing works, the writing works, but when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Well, it depends. Yeah, and another good bit, too, this is, again, a clip I saw, is a bit where they're in the record store, and Rufus looks at an album, and he goes, hmm, really nice guy, and the record he's holding is an album of a George Carlin stand-up performance. Yes, I was just gonna, yeah, they do reference that, yep, that was one of the trivia things you should know. Um, Oh, they, they should never, they should never plug George Carlin in a kid's... Cartoon, just stand-up routines. Come on, it, yeah. it's George Carlin. I mean, yeah, it's George Carlin. Um, 
I was going to say, yeah, season one is actually really, really good. Him, Barbera, and the original cast is the way to go. Season two, on, however, is a completely different story. So, Mort, M- Matt mentioned the, the cast of the season two, which, if those of you who don't know, the season two of the anime series is really the cast of the live action series. Oh. Christopher Kennedy as Bill, Evan Richards as Ted, so they re- and Tara Sharendoff as Mary Jane. So they- Tara Sharendoff. Oh, never mind. Oh, it's freaking Tara Strong. <laughs> yeah. I am uh, a fan. Where the hell did Tara... But it's... it's um, it was... Deke, who did the second um, season, and I was reading an interview with um, the lead animator from Hannah Barbera about the show on some website, and he mentioned that Deke, they joked around around the studio saying Deke stood, stood for um, done, do it cheaply, so they do it cheaply. Oh, that's a that's a common joke with, uh, Every. with the company. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, season two, it looks bad. It looks really bad. I mean, oh. <laughs> um, but the live action series, I wanted to mention really briefly because I did see um, a couple episodes of that prior to the screen, this episode. Um, so there was a pilot and an on air pilot. Uh, episode one, on air, there's an on air pilot, and the on air pilot is much better than the first episode. First episode is basically um, Bill and Ted work at this paint shop, and um, they leave their phone booth unattended, and their boss gets into the phone booth and gets traveled back into medieval times, and they have to go back in time to get them back into the present. Mm. And, With what? Um, yeah. With hookers and blackjack. <laughs> and Nate the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> Rufus, no. I'll let you have that one. Because um, after his, their boss goes into medieval times, Rufus comes back, and he's like, you gotta save him, and he brings him another phone booth to go back in time and save him. And it, it was just confusing. It's just like, this was this is not good. What the hell is this? The on-air pilot, which was, um, didn't finish filming. It was, there was part one that was filmed. And that one had much more promise to it. Um, Promising basi- premise. Basically... Basically, in the on-air pilot, which you can see on YouTube, is um, Bill and Ted um, go in their phone booth, and they travel to this black-and-white gangster world. Um, not it's world. A, it, it's a comic book, isn't it? Yeah, it's a comic book. I was going to mention it. It's, like, it's a comic book they realize, because they open up the book they see, and they're like, Whoa, man, that's us. Look at that. Oh, look at that handsome dude in there. That looks like you. Take on me. It, it's it's pretty cool because um, they end up helping this girl from a gangster, and they take her back to the present, into the real world, from not from the print world, and she's all in black and white, and it's got like a Pleasantville vibe to it. Because if you ever seen the film Pleasantville, it's, um, you know, black and white turns into color, and she turns into color eventually throughout the episode, and now she's talking to Missy, Bill's stepmother, and she convinces the the black and white girl to uh, pursue some stuff with money, you know, do some stuff, and then she goes up in the cab, and then part one episode ends with Bill and Tate chasing after her, trying to get her back to the comic book world, and that's it. And then mm. I was thinking, like, wait, why can't the show be like that? Because, you know, it kind of delves into expansion. Like, the phone booth can go beyond time. It can go through uh, media, like comic books or whatever, mm-hmm. which I think was unique. Um, the funny thing about the live-action series is that they use stock footage from the actual movie. They take the time travel bits and they just put it in the show, just placed it in there, and they loop it for each time they travel through time. Oh boy! <laughs> and um, so, what I'm getting with is, Fox was doing this live action series, and when um, him, when Deke got um, the second season of anime series, it was showed on Fox Kids on Fox. 
So they're like, okay, who's going to be the cast? Oh, the live action um, actors can voice the animated roles. And, and how well does it work? <laughs> I just, I couldn't, the, these two actors, I could not get into them as Bill and Ted. I mean, the, the, uh, I'm so, looking at some of the synopsis right now, and it feels like it's rejected storylines from time, uh, what is it? Uh, it's the show with uh, Peabody and Sherman it was on Cartoon Network and they're going back in time to save historical figures or something like that. They have, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. Time, oh, time something. Time something. Time cops. No, <laughs> no, no. Mark Hamill is in it. No, I know who you mean. Who yes, I time remember squad. that one. Is it Time Squad? Uh, or something? I remember one time episode. Squad. Yes, squad. Time Squad. Time Squad. Yes, time squad. I'm looking at it right now, and there's a synopsis for an episode where they go back in time to save Albert Einstein, and yep. he wants to be a stand up comedian. Yep, yeah, that's what yeah. I read. So, oh, so yeah, that, um, that that is definitely. I was there's also an interview with um the actor that plays Bill in the live action series, and one of the question was um, what factors do you think contributed to the series not becoming a more of a success? To uh, summarize, um, uh, they mentioned the other TV shows based on films, like he said, um. The Fox didn't want to do a second season, so uh, the producer wanted to take the show to Nickelodeon, which would have been great. But really? it's just it was weird. But um, it didn't give much chance for premiering shows on cable stations. So the, he goes on saying the reason that the television series of Weird Science did very well because it was on cable and had that large episode order advantage that I'm talking about. And then he goes on to mention, don't forget other John Hugh movie to television series like Ferris Bueller and Uncle Buck were on network broadcasts. Once again, they had short-lived lives like our show. So he's basically saying that network is not a very good place to broadcast a show. you got to be on cable to be a success. Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Well, either that or maybe the show just stank. It, it just stank. <laughs> the live action series just... Yeah. Eh. It's not your fault. It's everyone else's. I, I, I... I'm sure you tried your hardest, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, your show stinks. So, last but not least in our screening, I had to show a live action series. Just oh, to... that was a brilliant segue. I see what you did there. Yeah, because um, he, he mentioned Ferris Bueller, and why not talk about the show about Ferris Bueller that NBC did back in the early 90s? Mm-hmm. Where do I begin with this show? Start off with how it started. The I know. Mike, incredible Mike, opening Mike. Ever. Mike, I want to say, when it comes to this series, I can only get past the opening, and that was it, so I'm going to let you take up the reins, and I'm going to keep my mouth shut about the rest of this. I'm going to. So, this show has the balls, has the balls to do something daring in the pilot episode. So, okay, how do I... Okay, the way this show sets up is that TV Ferris Bueller uh, is so popular that he gets his own movie based on him and he talks about um matthew broderick portraying him and he tends to pull out a cardboard cutout of him out of the closet pulls out a chainsaw (laughs) and starts slicing his head off like he he says you know matthew broderick he's not me he he was just not just too much of a stuck-up white guy you know Mm-hmm. And, and now, yeah, we're going. <laughs> so, that's what the show is. It's not um, the movie Ferris you think of. It's a totally different universe. It's just like the movie is set in the universe of the TV version. And and get this, um, it's not set in Chicago like the movie. It's set in California. Oh, in the West Coast. Oh. 
The Adventures mm-hmm. of Pete and Pete was more of a TV Ferris Bueller than TV Ferris Bueller. No. Even that was deadpan. No, no, no. Say by the Bell it was more of a TV Ferris Bueller than TV Ferris Bueller was. <laughs> Come, my darling, we should go to Actually, the beach. The cameras are Ferris... empty. Actually, TV Ferris Bueller is more Saved by the Bell than Saved by the Bell. It is. I swear to God, because you see him doing... Um, high school hijinks. It's just you see him in daily life, and oh my God, Ferris Bueller is such a uh, a arrogant, uh, smug Rick. bastard. Oh, I mean, my. well, here is here here is uh, the way to, to to sort of sum it up uh, briefly. Um, if you're if you're going to start out the way that they did. It's sort of a it's sort of a way of saying, yeah, we're bigger, we're better, we're all that in a bag of bag of bag of, uh, bag of potato chips, Roman sausages. But uh, uh, you better if you're going to cut Matthew Broderick in half, you're gonna be have to be able to come out and say afterward, you're better than that. And the irony is that Matthew Broderick cardboard is the least cardboard thing about this entire <laughs> series. Everyone else, everyone else is so cookie cutter cardboard cutout. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! Yeah. Um. So. Because I keep thinking this TV Ferris Bueller is, is more like Zach Morris because um, he talks to the camera, of course, breaking the fourth wall. But he does these, like, uh, schemes and has these favors from people to give them rides and stuff. And there's this one point uh, he comes to school in this limo that uh, he has a favor for the driver, you know, take me to school. And he gets to, there's, like, assembly going on for the first day of school. And he pulls out this uh, button. And he's just like, all right, one, two, three, click. And the principal goes through this, like, open door hatch through on the stage. I'm thinking, that's not real. How, how did he, how did he get the, 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 what? He spent, he spent all night building that just so he could piss off the, just so he could piss off the principal. I mean, at, at. Which the principal, which is like a super villain. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. The yes. Would you like to be expelled? <laughs> oh, I I hated freaking portrayals of of public school officials like that throughout the throughout the um the 90s and into the early 2000s and this uh, here is the thing uh, with uh, with the principal uh, in in the film Ferris Bueller uh, John Hughes always had um, had some some interesting way of of making these guys even though they were even they were they were jerk characters, they were somewhat realistic or somewhat somewhat likable. Till Home Alone Two happened. Mm-hmm. So, and then, and they they used to say that they they said this frequently about John Hughes is that uh, when making movies like The Breakfast Club, he would uh, he would make those. Uh, the way that he did, because he had an understanding for uh, for kids and school officials and how things were. In uh, in Ferris Bueller, you have the TV series. You have none of that. You have okay. It's time to piss off the principal. Ha ha! I'm funny. You like me? No, I don't like you. <laughs> that was a dick yeah. thing to do. Also, another thing to add into the dick factor is mostly his sister. 
which is oddly enough played by Jennifer Aniston, which is the weirdest thing for me because I can't really see Jen. She, it's like it's still that Jennifer Aniston's face. Like, it's undeniably her. It's like, I can't really see her as a teenager. I still see her, like, how she is today as that, well, <laughs> don't want to sound bad, but as that hot MILF. So mm-hmm. I can't, so, like, it's kind of weird seeing her as a teenager. And, like, they try to make her so bitchy in comparison to Ferris Bueller. But there's a way, there's, like, a sense that you kind of sympathize her because of the crap that ferris bueller does to her be- rather it be like just stealing her car or even her uh i think it was uh, registration also for her car that well it could have been I, it was hinted i think it was a license thing. or something it was, it was at the end it. yeah and like she got it, she got she went into jail. It was like okay, and then Ferris Bueller just went. All right, time to go hack the police system. Here now, her post bail is uh, half a million dollars. What the hell? Well, yeah. yeah, what was that about? That was just mean. So, yeah, he's 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 a douche. I mean, and I told these guys I watched the rest of the season. I watched the other twelve episodes and. He's the same thing throughout the whole damn series. He's always the same to his sister. He's always this asshole. You know, they don't have a good uh, brother-sister relationship at all. Until one episode, apparently. There's one episode where he's like, Jeannie, we just gotta stop doing this. We, just, we should just be brother and sisters, and we should love each other all the time. And um, there's a sincere moment where something happened in the episode, and... Um, even though Jeannie was blamed for it, Ferris Bueller's like, I'm going to take the blame for it, just for you, sister. And you see Jennifer Aniston do a little tear coming down her eye. Oh. So, Too bad they pissed me off so much in the first one. I don't even want to know. No. Um, and then there's an episode where everything goes wrong for Ferris Bueller. It's just like he's not on top of his game like you see through his sh- shenanigans and stuff. So everything goes wrong in his... Hmm, that sounds interesting. And it, and it is. It's actually a really good episode. You see, like, he's he gets caught right away by the principal and the schemes don't work and, you know, he's just... It's just a downer. It's actually pretty interesting to <laughs> okay, see. Okay, I want to watch No, that that's episode. actually more of an uplifter. You see that hateable douchebag go down? Good. I might have to show you that episode eventually. That would be good just to see how it goes down. Um, but the Trust first... me, when you, see your, when you see hateable characters in pain, there's like a certain joy coming out of it. Um, oh, by the way, the... The person who plays Ferris Bueller is a na- guy named Charlie Shatler. He's been known for, let's see, he's been in a couple movies before this. He's been in 18 again. He's been, he's a voice actor now. He's a very v- good voice actor, apparently. He's been in um, Kick Butt Gatowski, Suburban Daredevil. He's been in Lunatic. That's prolific, pretty much. Yeah. He's been That's... in Lunatics <laughs> Unleashed as Ace Bunny. It's very random voice acting jobs here and there. Apparently, also uh, He's some good people. At something, would, I guess. Apparent. Well, also, um, video game fans would also recognize him as uh, apparently the. Vo- oh no! Is uh, he's the voice of Raiden in the short film Metal Gear Raiden Snake Eater, and he was also in the Metal Gear Solid Three Snake Eater game as uh, Major Rykov. So he's done some video game. He's probably more known in in like video game stuff. Mhm, mhm. But um, God, where was I gonna go? Oh, the funniest thing, and this is this is um prior to the screen in this episode recording. I uh I just came back just from watching um Transformers: Age of Extinction, and the actor who plays the principal in this show, he has like a little small role in this film. It's, oh no! Really? No! Like a a little tiny part at the beginning, like you see him. He's like the he's like a father to some character briefly, and you see him. He's like this granddad kind of thing, and he's like, "Is that him? Oh my god!" 
Is it? It's so weird to see him now. <laughs> Although, let's uh... be honest. Okay, well, let's be honest, guys. Would you see that principal in a Michael Bay movie? <laughs> oh, yeah. How fitting would that be? He's just, he's just the, the typical, like, uh, granddad character. He's like, you know, back in my day, we didn't have remakes, prequels. You know, he had crap because he used to own a, a movie theater. I can just see him right now. I was like, hmm, a giant robot that destroyed a part of the school. Hmm, that'll be double detention for you. And the head And while going... Jennifer Aniston, I shall give one extra detention for you. And then they have a crossover episode where, and and then they have a crossover episode where he uh, where he teams up with the faculty from Recess. <laughs> uh. Oh my god. Um, now I can only imagine is that Ferris Bueller has apparently did a favor for Optimus Prime. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. And he later calls up like, "Hey, uh, I'm just prime, and uh, you can do me a favor. You can come on over and be my ride to the prime." Yeah. <laughs> hey, Optimus Prime, I need to impress a girl. Can you bring me to her? Of course I will. <laughs> <laughs> Trixie, I recommend that you bring Bueller to the prom. You reject that hunky guy over there. Which I can easily crush. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, that's that's what we did for the screening. I, we did four shows. <laughs> oh mm-hmm. my god. Ferris Bueller, I mean, if you're curious enough to see that based upon what we talked about in the cult open of the pilot episode and you want to see what happens, knock yourself up. But if, if you can't get past the cult open then that's fine, because nobody doesn't seem... It's just, like, blows your mind. Yeah, we won't blame you. 